James. So turn with me, if you will, tonight to James chapter 2, and we'll pick up our study at the 14th verse. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. I'm sure that some of you have heard or remember even in your own studies that Martin Luther didn't look too highly on this book. It was a right straw epistle, as he called it, very dry and boring. And besides that, there was just too much works in this instead of grace. And uh, <clears throat> I'm not really trying to compare myself or bring the great man down, but I think he missed the point on this one significantly. And he's got it straight now, though, I'm really quite sure. And... <clears throat> I'm sure he's got a letter of apology waiting for us when we all get there as well. And if he would have just said, had I listened to John Calvin, it would have worked okay. All right, now that we've had the deep edifying things, let's have a closing word of prayer and we can go home. Notice that what we are doing is we are following this outline and actually we're making it to the midway point so far as the outline is concerned. We've dealt with the salutation where we pointed out that essentially uh, this is like just about any other epistle that you would find written in that time period. Uh, they all had a, a salutation like that. They might have been asking for some other kind of God's protection. I have uh, some manuscripts or at least some translation or some copies of manuscripts that are uh, secular in nature and there's one where the opening sounds almost like any epistle in the New Testament and the kind of greetings, except that they, the young one wanted some Egyptian god to be blessing his parents. Other than that, you couldn't tell the difference. Notice that there is, and this is very important, and one of the most important things that I think that we can learn from God's Word when it comes to practical living, the trials and temptations are not of zero value and worth. In the Christian walk, everything is of value and worth. Even the sin that comes into one's life, evidently we can be an example to others as what not to be. But also even for ourselves, it seems like there are times when after we go through some of those dark hours that we've brought on ourselves, we thank God for His grace, and we also thank God for His forgiveness. And we are not advocating something that is contrary to Paul's statement, should we continue to sin, that grace may abound. That's not what we're talking about at all. We're talking about 
that when this happens, that because of our walk with the Lord, there is value in all things. To hear and to do. This is the first foundation that is being laid for what we're dealing with tonight. That faith without appropriate works is dead. And when we are called upon to hear the word and basically make some proclamation about it, but we don't live it, then we are looking at some type of an example of a dead faith. And of course, favoritism. When it comes to practicalities, a person always has to be careful about how he deals with other people and everything. Otherwise, somebody's going to cry, oh, there's favoritism. That's one thing, but when it's really there, that's something else again. And that brings us up tonight to faith and works. And the basic issue that we'll see in this is I've set out something of an outline, and that is the value of one's faith. We are talking value here. And we're talking about the practical example of dead faith as well as the demonstration of a living faith, and then the conclusion. But notice that the basic issue is indeed the personal value of one's faith. Even as we mentioned this morning, compared to other things in your life, how valuable is your faith? At one point, when would you discard your faith to keep something of greater value and worth? James wants his readers to understand that not all claims to faith are valid. And that challenges the worth of the faith itself. And he also wants to emphasize the point that there is a living faith and there is a dead faith, and it is true. Not all faiths are the same. We hear people today, and it's been big for some decades now, the important thing is that you have faith. It's not so important what kind of faith you have, just so long as you have faith. You can have faith in the demon of the door. If you were to be a part of the Greco-Roman scenario, and notice that the readers should understand that the living faith is a saving faith. And a saving faith is the root of a living faith. And the dead faith is indeed just that, dead and non-saving. So what is the value of having a dead faith? That is the question that needs to be asked by any number of people. And the difference can be observed in that the living faith is an expressive working faith and the dead faith is non-expressive and non-working. In other words, when someone says, I never speak of religion and politics, one has to ask the question, why? Eventually, there is some time, some place, when if we have a living faith, it has to come out. It has to be expressed. And those are some of the things that James deals with. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? Notice that the fundamental question is the personal value or the advantage that is derived from one faith. Years ago when, when Bill, and I think I've used this before, Bill was going through the book of Revelation at the men's Bible study. This was in the first couple years that I was here. And we were back somewhere in the depths of the book of Revelation and Bill was really drawing out some of the minor points to see if we can get back to what the answer would be to the question. And all of a sudden, one of the men in attendance basically says, and what's that got to do with the man in the street? Now, that's an interesting question, because if it has nothing to do with the man in the street, what value is it? But on the other hand, if it had nothing to do with the man in the street, why is it in God's book? because what Bill was doing was really right on target. He wasn't way out there somewhere. And so the question comes, what is the value? And at the very foundation, the question will be, can that faith save him? The fundamental question is the personal value or the advantage 
that is derived from one's faith. The idea of advantage is not externally comparative. The idea here is not for me to say, oh, look at me, I have saving faith, and Joe Bananas has none. Lucky me. There may be some point where a comparison should be made, but this is not the idea. It is not externally comparative at all. It does not ask if one's faith provides an advantage over another person's faith, although that may come to question sometime, but it is not the question here. Instead, the question is one of internal and individualized advantage. How has my life improved since I embraced Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior by faith? That is what is at issue. What would my life be today if I did not have faith in Jesus Christ? I think a question like that was raised a long time ago when I was in high school by one of a, by our youth pastor, and I scratched my head and said, who knows? But now after so many years, I know the difference, and I think you do too. After we have a few more years and mileage behind us and we can look back over the road, we can say, this is the way it has been with Jesus Christ as my present, ever-present companion. But what would it be like without him? Take a look at some of the things that you've gone through, that we've seen people go through. And how many times have we said or have we heard it said, I don't know what I would do without the Lord. There is a statement of value. The question is, now that I am a person of faith, am I better off than I was without faith? And the issue deals with ultimates. The question is, do I or do I not have a saving faith? It starts there. That is the starting line. And that's part of the issue here. And notice that when we start off in this particular section, what, is, what use is it, my brethren? He's raising questions to folk in the congregation. The assumption is that when you come in to be a part of the congregation, you are a part of the congregation because you're a part of the body of Christ. But that is not always a given. This question is being raised in the company of the brethren, the company of those who make saving claims. And the question of salvation within the fellowship is still a valid question. Others deal with the same issue. Notice it's pretty common among the apostolic writings. Notice Paul in writing to the Corinthians, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you fail the test. Now that is really putting it to that congregation. And every time I read First and Second Corinthians, I remember a, a lady one time at an alumni gathering, and she had two wishes that would never be fulfilled. One wish, she wishes that she could stay with the alumni gathering all the time because it's a real taste of heaven. Now, I was on that campus for 10 years. I graduated from there three times. Never once did I ever see it as a taste of heaven. There were some good things that happened there, but it was far, far below the standard of celestial bliss, trust me. And the second thing she wanted to do was go back to New Testament times so she could be with the saints and she could be also with the apostles and all that. And basically I was eavesdropping. I was really not a part of the conversation. It's kind of like I'm talking to Roger and Sue over here and Dale and Sandy are talking over there, and while I'm smiling at the Pettits, I'm listening to the Malors, and I almost turned around and said, you want to go back there? How would you like to be, oh, crucified upside down, the way Peter was? Or how would you like to be a member of the Church of Corinth? You know, you've got all kinds of party strife and division. I am of Paul, I am of Apollos. First liar doesn't have a chance, so the last one steps in and says, I am of Christ. Then, of course, you've got all of this theological mix-up. You've got some guy who is messing around either with his mother or his stepmother, and you want to be a member of that church? 
you have not been in the pastor at all, lady, otherwise you'd never say those things. Now somehow, I remember, all of this comes back to, there are times when somehow, some way, the question has to be raised. Are you in the faith? You are a churchgoer. You may know the Apostles' Creed. You may know Nicene. But are you in the faith? And put yourself to the test. And examine yourselves. Otherwise, how are you going to know if Jesus Christ is or is not in you? And notice again in 1 Corinthians 11. For in the per first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. Did I not say that every bad thing has its upside? Take a look at this one. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, and that is around the communion, I hear that divisions exist among you. What were they when we go on the text? Well, the rich people come over here, and they have, they've brought their own uh, potluck with them, and they have a good stout bunch of uh, solid red wine, and before you can ever get around to the communion service, they're already bashed. And over on this side of the church came the people who were poor, and they didn't have a whole lot to bring. They maybe had a dry dill pickle or something, but that was all. They come in hungry, they go out hungry. These come in, and they should have gone out hungry. And so there are divisions, and they're serious, and they're deep. But then notice what Paul says, and, I, and in part I believe it. But know this much for sure, that there must also be factions among you so that those who are approved may become evident among you. And sometimes you have to have the head-on confrontation, as distasteful as it is, and as worrisome as it can be, and life-changing and all of those things. But there is a value placed upon the body of Christ being truly the body of Christ. And Christ will permit, if not direct, factions to come in so that everybody will know who the true believer is, who the one is who is committed to Christ. Now, it doesn't always come out as smoothly as I've said it here, and if you've ever been through one of those wars, one is enough. But notice there is still value to it. Because it's under the duress that we find the faithful. The matter of conduct, according to Paul, raises the issue as to who are the approved of the Lord and who are not. And notice that Paul even tells the church in Rome to be on the alert for such people and avoid them since they do not belong to the Lord. Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eyes on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned and turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. Notice the issue that was raised here by Paul. It was raised again in our epistle in 1 Peter this morning, was it not? And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. I think there is a difference between gullibility and pure faith. And someone who is of pure faith does not have to be gullible. So I urge you to keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching. Notice faith and practice. An improper faith will lead to an improper practice. And that's what Paul is having to deal with here. And notice where their hearts happen to be. For these, for such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. And notice John. 
Notice the years that are covered here as well. Paul writing early on, John writing at the close of the apostolic era. Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. You do see and understand clearly, don't you, that sometimes a split is a real blessing. When that split is marking a distinction between the religious believer and the religious unbeliever, God is interested in the purity of faith. And the numbers don't make as much difference to him as they do to us. And would to God that we would always have our priorities straight. They went out from us because they were never a part of us. And remember in 1 John, the issue was, who is Jesus Christ? And to succumb or to give in to what this faction was saying would ultimately be a denial of the person of Jesus Christ as truly God and truly man. If they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us, but they really are of the world. And so we see that James points out the difference between a saving faith and a non-saving faith. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? Notice that the second question, as it is, answers the first question. And this is not an information-seeking question. It demands a non-affirmative or a negative answer. The question is, in the second one, that faith cannot save him, can it? If we were to tweak it just a little more literally, that's the way it would come out. And what he is saying is that someone says he has faith, but he has no works. He has a faith that is not a saving faith. For a saving faith has its own set of works that expresses the possessor's faith to be alive and life-changing. Now notice that the works of faith are nothing other than being a doer of the word. I think this must be the part that good old Martin Luther missed. There are, faith, there are works of self-righteousness and there are works that declare the righteousness of Jesus Christ to be ours. And there's a difference. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. The works of faith are nothing other than being a doer of the word, and the doer of the word is the one with the living, saving faith. And not only does the hearer have a dead faith, he has deluded himself. And that is really the troublesome thing. Have you stopped to think about it for a moment on a human level? Discounting for the moment, only for the sake of the discussion, discounting for a moment the necessary convicting work of the Holy Spirit. But when we have to look people head on and try to deal with them, do you not see that it is easier to deal with a self-avowed atheist than it is an atheist who claims to be a Christian? Because the atheist who claims to be the Christian says, hey, I'm just one of you. We're all together. You're one of us. We're all the same. Not quite the case. You get some bulldog atheist who comes in and says you're nothing but going about by blind faith and all of the other things that they say. The lines are clearly drawn. And in some ways, just from the human perspective alone, when the power of God goes to work, that's an entirely different thing. But trying to size up how you're going to address the situation, it's a more clean-cut thing to deal with someone who is an avowed disbeliever than one who is one of a dead faith. Notice that it is equally important to point out that the works of faith are expressed through love and through love alone. And this is the difference. 
For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. In Christ Jesus, some of the, the works, the ceremonial works of the Old Testament mean really nothing, not anymore. What does mean everything is faith that works through love. And I know that when I say this, I'm saying it to people who understand. Faith has only one channel in which and by which it expresses itself. You don't turn to channel super faith or channel sub faith and get different expressions of faith. Or you get channel love, channel little bit of love, channel friendship. No. Faith expresses itself by one instrumentality and one instrumentality alone, and that is love. And that is love as it is described by God's word, both Old Testament and New, that we love the Lord with the totality of our being and we love our neighbor as ourselves. And this is the only way that true faith is expressed. And notice, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Given our Lord's directive, it is mandatory that works take place as an expression of love and thus implicitly an expression of faith. You will keep my commandments if and only if you love me. And if you keep my commandments because you love me, you will do these commandments out of love for me, but out of love for those to which you are dealing or with whom you are dealing. The value of one's faith. The question is, do I or do I not have a living faith? If I have a living faith, then my life is greatly improved because of God's grace. And notice that there is a practical example of a dead faith as well. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Notice once again, the question of value comes to the surface. The first thing that we read was, what use or what value is it, my brethren? if someone says that he has faith, but he has no works. Now notice here, the question then comes back, what use is that? What use is that to you who are making the pious statement, go, be warm, be filled, go in peace? There are those believers who are in acute and possibly chronic need. Notice that the question is, if a brother or a sister is without clothing or in need of daily food. If you are going to do this to the family, where do you fit into this family? There are those believers who are in acute and possibly chronic need. And there are those professed believers who can meet that need. And these professed believers demonstrate a pious manner when they offer them up to God's care. Go in peace. May the shalom of God be yours. And if the shalom of God is yours, your stomach won't growl. And if the shalom of God is yours, you won't mind being naked. Because you see, that's the actual term that's used is without clothing, is naked. We don't mean that they're actually naked, but that's how bad of shape they're in. And these believers demonstrate a pious manner when they offer them up to God's care, yet they refuse to meet the needs of the brothers and the sisters. And again, the question is rhetorical. It is understood that the claimed faith is not useful and what is learned here is this, if our faith is not useful to others, then it's not useful to us. 
And under these circumstances, the self-professed believer is in a no better state than when he was a self-professed unbeliever. And verse 17 gives us the principle that is involved. Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. It stands alone. It is a creed, and we will see in just a few moments, it can even be a super-Orthodox creed, that it has no fault, no failing, but it still stands alone. The credo, the statement of faith, also, if it is a real statement of faith, should generate the deeds of love. There is a claim to faith, but this dead faith, because it stands alone, is dead. The living faith never stands alone. And there is always the statement of faith and the practice of faith. And that gets back to a comment that we made this morning, that our lives as Christians, they're based on two pillars. These pillars make up the foundation. Over the years, it's been called different things. Sometimes it's called doctrine and morals. Sometimes it's called dogma and ethics. More recently, it seems to be called faith and practice or theology and application. But notice these are the two pillars of our Christian walk. And we cannot be healthy if we don't have those two pillars. Now there are certainly times when we're speaking of theology, as the old cliche goes, how many angels sit on the head of a pin. That really was not theology, that was scholastic philosophy. And we need to know clearly for our theology what the Word of God has to say. For one who looks at himself as being a part of the tradition of the Reformation, particularly the Swiss, there was a main break. The first generation of reformers really took seriously sola scriptura, God's word and his word alone. And they basically would say there comes times when we don't understand and when we don't have enough information we have to live with, I don't know. But the second generation took on some of the scholastic thinking of medieval times, and they would start filling in the blanks based on their logic. When God wants to keep something to himself, he will do so, and no human logic is going to pry the door of knowledge open. And if God is going to reveal something, it will be revealed. And the one thing that I have learned is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. First of all, our knowledge will be limited because God has only given to us limited information. And woe be to the person who tries to fill in the blanks. They stay blank because God wants them that way. We know in part, and therefore we preach and we teach only in part. And the person who thinks he has it all is the person who is really altogether out to lunch. And this is why Paul, for example, speaks in his prayer to the Ephesians that God would enlighten the eyes of their heart because we also see through a glass dimly. So notice the disadvantage. First of all, we don't have the full information. And therefore, we can only preach and teach what we know, and it will be partial in light of everything that can be there. And secondly, we look through the glass dimly. We do not have the clearest capability to understand everything. And therefore, one of the most sanctified things that can ever be said is, I don't know. 
there is always the statement of faith and the practice of faith. But the statement should reflect the word of God only. One of the best statements I've ever heard from a theologian is, our theology comes from the word of God and it is compared by the word of God, but it never replaces the word of God. And then there is the demonstration of the living faith. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. Two parts to this disputation. Part one, there is one who claims to have faith but no works. And there is one who has faith and works. Now the challenge for each one is to clearly demonstrate the existence of its faith. This was really a sucker's bet, don't you think? Can't you see that person going up there and says, well, you have faith and I have works. Show me, how do you demonstrate your faith without works? This was a sucker's bet from the beginning. Now that is a good time-honored theological statement. Nothing worldly about a sucker's bet. It's just common language. And the challenge is for each position to clearly demonstrate the existence of its faith, and the one side offers to demonstrate his faith by the works of faith. And the faith work side challenges the faith non-work side to demonstrate his faith. Oh yeah, I believe. And what does that say? It becomes obvious that it is impossible to demonstrate one's faith apart from the works of faith and love. The second part of the disputation. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. Here's where we see how faith plus the works of faith clearly define who we are in contrast to others. The insufficient limit of faith without the practice. There is the sincere belief in the oneness of God. Notice in Jewish thinking it can't get any more orthodox than this. You believe that God is one? You do well. I love the sarcasm here. He's really being sarcastic. You do well, but please take just this little bit of note. The demons also believe, and a bit differently from you, they tremble. They have a practical understanding of how this is applied. The demons hold to the same view, and they are unsaved beyond salvation. They understand the practical value of the view. They know the practical value. And for them, they shudder at the application and the implication of this statement of faith. You believe that God is one. The one making the Christian claim to faith based on orthodoxy alone may be in a worse position than the demons, given that they understand the consequences and the human claimant does not. The argument is that if faith is not expressed by a specified set of works, then anyone can claim faith in Christ. Notice that many who make such claims will be forever disappointed. Matthew records the words of our Lord when our Lord said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Many who make such claims will be forever disappointed because like the, like the demons, they did not do the acts of faith. They did not do the will of the Father. Instead, like the demons, they practiced lawlessness. 
this is one of the reasons why I place such an emphasis on knowing the word. Because the only way that we can really know people of genuine faith is how well they know the word and how well they want to do it. Everything else that has taken place in the apostolic era or in Old Testament times, raising the dead, miracles, you name it, these things can be counterfeited. But the one thing that cannot be counterfeited is a person who has a faith in Jesus Christ and will live out his faith according to the commandments of Christ. That is the only genuine standard. And in this day and age, when all of a sudden, People are claiming they see resurrected folk and this, that, and the other. My first question is, what are they doing with the Word of God? Because even in the days of Christ, the miraculous and with the apostles, the miraculous was always intended to point back to the gospel and to point back to Jesus Christ as the resurrected, ascended, reigning, and returning Lord. And so for me, I will say it out front. I am a bit skeptical about the time somebody comes walking in and says somebody just sat up and started spitting out dirt because he crawled out of the tomb or all of a sudden somebody grew a nose on his face or whatever. I want to know where is the Word of God and what are they doing with it because everything else can be made counterfeit. And this is one of the passages that you see here. Examples of a living faith. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? I want you to underscore the term foolish because it can also be translated vain, which takes on the idea of emptiness. And when you see the emptiness and you put it next to the question of value, you see that James is really pushing this argument home. The foolish fellow is foolish because he fails to see the force of the argument. Specifically, he is foolish because he fails to see that faith without works, without strength, is therefore useless. He is foolish because his position is one of self-imposed ignorance and he is heretofore unwilling to recognize the force of the argument. James offers two historical examples. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works and as a result of the works, Faith was perfected. Abraham. The statement is made that Abraham was justified by his works when he offered up Isaac. But we know, don't we, that from Genesis 15, before Isaac was born, Abraham believed God when he made the promise to bless, and God at that time reckoned it to him as righteousness. Several years before Isaac was born, God declared him to be righteous. But notice as we travel on, Abraham was historically declared righteous when he offered up Isaac, when Isaac was a young adult. And it was on the occasion of the offering that Abraham's faith was in harmony with his works. You see that faith was working with his works. They were coherent. They interfaced. They were mutual complement. It was not some kind of work over here and faith over there. This is a faith that expresses a work, and that work expresses the faith. But what I like also is that even way in advance, what we see is that Abraham's work 
was consistent with what Jesus told his disciples. But I want to jump here, or move up to here. I underscored the term, Scripture was fulfilled. And this has important meaning for you and me, it seems. Notice that when Abraham believed, God imputed or counted that to be the equivalent, that faith to be equivalent of righteousness. But many years later, at a most critical point, when God was being put on the line and in the dock, so to speak, because all of the promise was to come through Isaac. And now Isaac is to be offered up as a sacrifice. There it is. The stakes are high. But notice that when Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, the scripture was what? It was fulfilled. Think about that for a moment. The day that Abraham believed in God, so that it was counted to him as righteousness, that attribution of God was a prophecy that the day would come when his acts would demonstrate the reality and the truthfulness of his faith. I think something like sanctification comes to mind for us. But when we are declared righteous in Christ, that declaration is also a prophecy that we will, in fact, live out our lives in such a way that our faith will be demonstrated to be true. Have you ever stopped to consider that you are a walking prophecy? And that somewhere in our lives, we have to have the crisis that Abraham had. And to me, this is a very moving passage. And once again, you see that man is justified by works and not by faith alone. And then we come to Rahab the harlot. Always an interesting passage. Notice that in the same way, notice, in the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? So much for being a patriot. But she was a patriot to the king of kings. And notice that when we go back, she had made her own confession of faith to the extent that she had knowledge. She confessed that Israel's Lord is both the God of heaven and earth. And when we heard it, meaning of what was God was doing through you, our hearts melted and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. And she had placed her trust in the Lord. For in the same way as Abraham, Rahab the harlot was justified by her works when she received the prophets and sent them out another way. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. As the spirit is to the body, so works is to faith. Thus when the spirit is absent from the body, the body is then dead. Thus also when works are absent from the body of faith, that faith is dead. There can indeed be no saving, justifying, living faith except that which expresses the works of loving obedience. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. Isn't that a great passage? Now, if you don't see the grace of God there, you'll never see it anywhere, in my view. What a great little epistle. Father, thank you for this night. Thank you for this time that we could gather together and to give some thought to your word as it unfolds, sentence by sentence, 
clause by clause, phrase by phrase, word by word. And we thank you that this stands as your testimony to us of your faithfulness to us and of your requirements of us. May we be men and women of the word. May we seek to be men and women who have been justified by faith and who know that they have and that there have been any number of moments in their life when that declaration of righteousness has been fulfilled. In Christ's name we pray, amen.